The regular season is over. The Rangers finish it off with a 4-2 win over the Yankees. End of the season on a two-game winning streak with some beautiful notes, a wonderful final game for Tom Grieve, and some special, special moments on what has been a mostly disappointing season. All that and more on this episode of Locked On Rangers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Rangers. Your daily Texas Rangers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked on to the Texas Rangers. I'm Bryce Patrick, a cripplingly addicted Texas Rangers fan since 2010, the founder and host for all four seasons of this Locked On Rangers podcast. Today is Thursday, October 6th. The regular season is done, and your Rangers finish 68 and 94. One one win away from a very nice season, but they they got the other the the other funny number, a 420 winning percentage. If you don't know what that means, don't worry, mom, don't ask me. Thank you all so much for making Locked On Rangers your first listen every single day. If you're not already, you can follow me on Twitter at Bryce Paddock. You can follow the show at Locked On Rangers and subscribe on YouTube where the best way you can help grow the show is to comment any single thing below. The Rangers prevented the Yankees from getting to 100 wins on the season. It doesn't really change a whole lot. They're still going to be the second seed in the playoffs. They still won the American League East, and the Rangers finish with a 68-94 and record, which is also the exact same record as the Colorado Rockies. Now, they finish fourth in the division, ahead of the Oakland A's, who had 102 losses, the exact same record that the Rangers had last year. They are eight games better than they were last year, but still, after adding a whole lot of talent, obviously, with still some pretty big holes on the team, it feels like just just a bit, just a bit of a disappointing season. The Rangers were, I think, better than their record indicates, at least at the very, very beginning. Their Pythagorean win-loss record had them at 77 and 85. I honestly think that's about how good this team was. Still, I don't think even if things went a little bit better, if they had a healthier John Gray, if some other things broke their way, I don't think this team was going to reach 500 this year. And you know what? That's okay. The outset, I thought, you know what? About 10 wins would be a really great improvement if they could avoid, uh, you know, more than 90 losses. That would have been great. That didn't happen. The Rangers end up uh, with 94 losses. They did avoid being a 95 loss team. So, uh, you know, progress, just a little bit of progress and eight, eight wins better. Still almost, almost to where we thought that magic number would be of 10 wins better, but this was a solid, thrilling, fun final game. Wasn't exactly how Tom Grieve said he wanted his final game. If he could pick how it would end, he would pick a Bubba Thompson inside the park home walk-off home run, which would have been really amazing. That would have been a really fun way to go. And honestly, uh, I think that would have been pretty spectacular. And uh, Dave Raymond talking about how at, at the end of the broadcast, some really sweet sentiments about, you know, I wish you could have had a, a better final season, a better final game, you know, just to end your career on with, you know, maybe uh, the notion of like going to the playoffs or whatever. And Tom Greaves like, that's just baseball. That's that's just that's how baseball goes. That's the way baseball go, as Ron Washington would say. But, you know, I am still proud of this team. They had some really great moments. It's been more fun than last year. It accomplished a lot of the things that I wanted to. I'll get into more of that, but I want to get into this final game. This is the last game breakdown I'm going to have at least Rangers game breakdown I'm going to have until spring training in March. Gosh, that is such a long time away and getting those end of season. I'm ready for baseball to be done, but also come back same time next year because I miss you a whole lot when you're gone. Rangers win this one four to two. Some pretty big offensive moments for Jonah Heim, who finished with a multi-hit game, including a massive, massive shot, his 16th home run of the season. And of course, it came during cookie talk, right? When Tom Grieve was talking about cookies, as soon as he did, Domingo Herman left a cookie right out over the plate, and Jonah Heim 
absolutely crushed it. The hardest hit ball and the furthest hit ball in this game, 400 feet and 112.4 miles an hour off the bat. But the story of this game for me was Glenn Otto going against his former team that drafted him, then traded him in the Joey Gallo deal. Granted, he hasn't been the best start of the Rangers have had this season, but he has been an integral part of this starting rotation, which again, needs some pretty big upgrades. I nothing against him. I would rather not see him in the starting rotation next year, but what he's done this year is valuable. I talked last year about, you know, Mike Foltynewicz and Jordan Lyles, despite them getting lit up a whole lot, they ate a whole lot of innings and prevented the Rangers from having to go and get guys in AAA that were not ready to start or some other veteran guys or just make some other moves because eating innings is valuable in a team that is not quite competing. Glenn Otto finishes with the third most innings by any Ranger this year at 135 and two thirds with a 464 ERA in 27 games, all of which were starts. Some really solid stuff for him. Uh, did have an issue with the walks. He walks per nine over four, 1.4 homers per nine, the most of any primary starter on the Rangers, but was really good at limiting the amount of hits against him all year. You look at some of his baseball savant numbers and it kind of shows why I think he needs to go to the pin. Almost everything is in the blue. The only thing that is in the red uh, is his extension. He's in the 89th percentile for his extension. Um, His fastball velocity is averaging 92 miles an hour, which is in the 35th percentile. That's going to bump way, way up when he is a late inning reliever with that nasty, nasty slider playing up even further. I think that strikeout rate will jump way up once he is in the bullpen. He is in the 20th percentile for strikeout rate. Um, Below that in chase rate and walk rate as well Um, he's giving up a lot of barrels not a whole lot of velocity fastball spin rate hard hit rate and curve spin are all right around middle of the pack so those are the things that he is doing best besides that extension had some really solid starts down the stretch Um, a couple of quality starts to finish out his season Uh, seven and ten was his record if you care about that i personally really don't but some people do care about those things went six innings in his last two starts allowed three earned runs in the last one, so two straight quality starts. He had five strikeouts in this one, seven in the one before that. Went five and two-thirds with just one earned run against Cleveland in his third-to-last start. So uh, really finished the season on a bit of a high note. His last 15 games, he had a 405 ERA in 80 innings, 64 strikeouts. Just fine. Serviceable number five starter stuff, and the Rangers needed every single bit of that from him, and it's good for him to get this nice start against his former team. Coming up, we're going to get into a guy who made his Major League debut on the final game of the season, a little bit more into uh, a home run that ties, ties in to Vin Scully. But first, this episode is brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for football betting info this season. Find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis on every single game that you can find. As always, BetOnline remains your continued source for all of your sports wagering information with live betting and up-to-minute scores for every sport out there. You know, it's, it's no longer baseball regular season. You can make some bets on who you think is going to go all the way in the playoffs. On tomorrow's show, I'm going to have an episode talking about former Rangers that are in the playoffs. Unfortunately, there's going to be no Elvis Andrews. Um, but there's definitely plenty of other teams you can bet against the Astros, uh, which is always a fun thing to do. Head to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action because BetOnline is where the game starts. Now, Charlie Culberson hit his second home run of the season in this one. Just an absolute wall scraper. Barely, barely get by in that left field corner, but it still counts all the same in Tom Greaves' final game. Charlie Culberson also had a home run in the final game of Vin Scully. I believe, if I remember correctly, that was a walk-off bomb as well. So uh, maybe the Rangers need to hire some legends throughout the game to, you know, come in, retire, uh, unretire, then retire, and Charlie Culberson might mash that uh, AL record of uh, 62 home runs that Aaron Judge set earlier this week. I don't know. Maybe there's something to that. Maybe it has to be genuine. It has to be in the actual moment. It can't just fake it, which is entirely possible. But there was another offensive moment that needs to be celebrated. Nathaniel Lowe got a single in his first at-bat and a walk and then was pulled out of the game. 
if he went over three, he would not have gotten a batting would not have ended the year with a batting average over three hundred. But he goes one for one, gets the walk, and they pull him for Mark Mathias to finish the season at 302. There were a lot of these little statistical moments that happened this week. Marcus Simeon scored his 100th run of the season. Adoles Garcia with that two-run bomb in the first game of the doubleheader got his 100 and 100, or 99th and 100th RBIs of the season. And Martin Perez, in his final start, kept his ERA below three. Just some fun little statistical moments there. Oh, and we got the 25-25 club for Marcus Simeon as well. Obviously, that was the important milestone that happened in the second game of that doubleheader. No other important milestone happened. So glad that all these people could show up. And uh, there was some home run people got excited about in the first inning of that game. I, I don't really remember it. But I do want to go back to that game because there was another moment besides the obviously monumentous 25-25 club, which the Rangers actually have two players in, in Adolis and Marcus Simeon. But I want to give some credit because the Rangers did win that game and they won their final two games of the season. I want to give some credit to Colby Allard. I need to eat some crow because I talked a lot of crap about Colby uh, over the season. Not that it was unjustified for the most part, but this was a really, really solid start or primary outing, whatever you call it. Hazel Tanoka was the opener for the one inning, allowed the judge home run, and then in comes Allard. Allard went four innings of just one run ball, walked two. The only run that he allowed was a massive shot by Giancarlo Stanton, his 31st of the season, which, again, that'll happen. But he only allowed two hits and two walks and struck out six in his four innings of work. Really kept that Yankee lineup in check in this one. And, uh, well, he allowed fewer runs than Garrett Cole, who, by the way, did set the Yankees' single-season record for strikeouts with his first strikeout of the game against these uh, Rangers. Taylor Hearn was honestly... Excellent. He was straight up excellent. Only allowed two walks in his three innings of shutout work. And then Matt Moore got his fourth save of the season in this one before getting his fifth save of the season in the finale on uh, Wednesday. But before him, Yuri Rodriguez, (laughs) during some great tag storytelling, the whole day was just about him. That's literally all of it was just about tag and so I kind of didn't notice until towards the end of the inning but Yuri Rodriguez made his major league debut thankfully they they did finally acknowledge it they kind of, I think went over a lot of people's heads I said oh there's some guy with some blonde hair on the mound that's weird uh oh yeah that's Yuri Rodriguez in his major league debut struck out the very first batter that he faced in the big leagues that is a really cool moment uh only allowed one hit didn't allow a walk he is a guy whose stuff is really up and down and I think He might, Grant Grant Schiller thinks that he is going to survive the 40-man cuts that are coming this offseason. He's got some really, really nasty stuff. He's been very inconsistent, has had some problems with walks, has had a few problems with home runs. But when he is on, he is absolutely disgusting. He was sitting uh, 97 with his fastball uh, in this one, did not have the fastest pitches. That was, of course, Dennis Santana. But I do want to give credit to Glenn Otto, who had 11 swings and misses. Some pretty good swings and misses from Dennis Santana, too, who is not typically a big strikeout pitcher, but got a pair of strikeouts in a scoreless inning in the eighth. His 20th hold of the season. Then Matt Moore comes in, allows just one walk and a strikeout, gets the save in the finale, and uh, yeah, caps off a really, really great season for him. If you would have told me at the beginning of the year that Matt Moore would be closing out a save against Yankees in the season, I would have slapped you in the mouth and called you a liar. And, uh, well, it turns out that would have been wrong. And so I'm glad that none of you told me that because that would have been really, really embarrassing for me to slap you and call you a liar only for you to be prophetic. So, uh, thank none of you for saying that, but it was a really cool moment to see Jose Trevino Homer in his final regular season game coming back here against the Rangers. A, a pretty decent shot. He had a multi-hit game. He was DHing in this one, which was uh, kind of interesting because it was a a real skeleton crew lineup. No Judge and uh, no John Carlos Stanton in this one, but they did have uh, Lemayhu and Rizzo and Oswaldo Cabrera, who is a top prospect who I, I think is going to be really darn good. He had a pretty good series uh, this. This series, and uh, Oswaldo uh, Peraza, I think that's his first name. Uh, Yeah, Oswald Peraza, not Oswaldo. There's just an extra O that I was adding in there. But uh, really solid outing for him. Leoli Tavares had one of the hardest hit balls in this game as well. Continues a three-game hitting streak. It might have been more. I think it might have been four. 
that he had a four game hitting streak to end the season, but he had the fourth hardest hit ball in this one at 107 miles an hour. He's absolutely stinging the ball to end the season, and that is a really, really nice thing for him. It's been a rough second half. He had a really, really great start to his major league season was just hitting the absolute crap out of the ball. Singles were dropping in everywhere, not super hard hit. Um, even had a few home runs, was just absolutely crushing it when he got up to the big leagues. Then the second half started, and he his offense just really, really declined. The defense never did. He was still absolutely elite defensively, but I'm really glad that he can get that confidence going into the end of the season. Same with Jonah Heim with that multi-hit game. Uh, everybody that started this game ended up getting a hit for the Rangers. 11 hits and three walks in this one to just seven strikeouts. Marcus Simeon got an RBI single to drive in Bubba Thompson, who had a double in this one. Some uh, tricky fielding and an annoying challenge. A really annoying challenge. I'm going to get into why that bothered me and why it actually kind of mattered just the smallest bit to the season series in this matchup. But first, this word from our sponsors. Now, late in this game, in the eighth inning, the Yankees were already down by two and probably not going to come back. The Yankees decided to challenge on a tag at home plate where Josh Young was driven in by, uh, by Jonah Heim. Well, turns out he got tagged on butt. Just very, very minimal play going from two runs to three runs, and they still ended up losing, and the offense couldn't mount anything. But one thing that bothered me about it is that, first off, it's the end of the season. It's the eighth inning. What, what the heck are we doing? Why are we, why are we challenging plays? <laughs> you can't get any higher in your postseason seating. But... One thing I did notice is that coming into this series, the Rangers were exactly even on run differential in the series, specifically against the Yankees. They lost one game. Uh, they lost two games, won one game in their first series, that three-game series in New York. But they scored exactly as many runs as the Yankees. And coming into this game, the Rangers were minus two on the season series in terms of run differential against the Yankees. So they finished the season series exactly even. And if they did not challenge that, the Rangers would have scored more runs against the Yankees than they gave up. They still end up with a losing record at three and four, but they would have scored more runs in the season series. So maybe the Yankees knew that. Maybe that's what they were trying to save, just a little bit of pride. Like, no, no, no. The Rangers are not going to outscore us in this season series, even though it doesn't really freaking matter. Just a fun little stat at the end of the season. But you know what? I think I think honestly that might have been just the smallest bit of a factor. I can't think of another reason. Like just get the game over with. Everyone's tired. Your two best hitters are not even in the lineup. Like just call it a freaking day and let it go. But they couldn't. So whatever. That's what we ended up with. Josh Young was tagged out. Uh, and just an annoying little fun fact there for you at the end of the season. But this was. A nice little game to end it on. Nice to end it with two wins. And, uh, yeah, ends with a 68-94 and 94 record. Not not exactly what I predicted. Not exactly what I hoped for. Definitely not what they hoped for. Probably not what you hoped for. Unless you're just a real pass mess and you're like, wow, well, at least they didn't suck worse than last year. Which, in that case, uh, I don't know how you watch baseball if you thought they were going to be worse than they were last year. But, uh, oof, pull, pull up your nose dive if, if you random hypothetical person are out there. But just some final thoughts on the season, some final leaderboards where the Rangers ranked in the American League. They did have a few guys in top 10 in some categories, including Marcus Simeon, who led the American League in games played. I, I think he also led the Major League in games played. He played 161 games. That one game where he sat out was literally the only one that he sat out. The only one all season, which is pretty darn impressive. Uh, but he did not lead the major leagues. There were two players in the American League, both Matt Olson and Dan G. Swanson, who played all 162. Francisco Lindor of the Mets played 161 as well. So not quite every single game. He was not the leader in Major League Baseball, but did lead the American League, was not tied with anybody there. But you look at the American League hits leaderboard uh the rangers don't have anybody that hits but batting average they do have someone in the top 10 nathaniel Lowe, with his 310 average is seventh in the american league in the ops category his 851 ops nathaniel Lowe, that is is ninth 
in the American League um, at bats. Marcus Simeon obviously led all of the American League there and played appearances with 724, obviously leading there. Uh, in terms of triples, the Rangers had a couple of guys who were tied for sixth in Garcia and Marcus Simeon. Both had five triples. So again, there they were in the leaderboards. And Corey Seager finishes the year top five in the American League in home runs with his 33 ribbies on the season. Stolen base-wise, Garcia and Simeon again tied with 25 at number five in the stolen base category. And uh, yeah, overall, pretty pretty solid offensive season. There were some improvements from last year. Last year, the Rangers had a honestly pretty dogged pitching staff and a really, really abysmal offense as well. And that was one of the things that just drove me insane. I can I can deal with, with the pitching getting lit up. I have seen that my entire life as a Rangers fan, even in the years before, I was a, a diehard obsessed fan. Like it has been the story of the Texas Rangers having bad pitching, but you have bad pitching and bad offense that makes for some miserable freaking baseball to watch. The Rangers have some really, really good offensive players and some really talented defensive ones as well. Pitching staff, obviously a mess. Obviously needs to be cleaned up and probably not going to have to spend half a billion dollars to do so. The first priority has got to be signing Martin Perez, who finishes with a f exactly 5.0 baseball reference war. The Rangers leader is Marcus Simeon at 5.7. Then Corey Seager, who jumped above that four mark at 4.1. Dolores Garcia, again, a really, really solid season. So the pieces are there. They are there. We saw Josh Young have some success late in the season. He is going to be everyday third baseman. I'm pretty darn sure that is locked away in left field. We got some questions there, and DH, who, as to who's going to do that, there are probably some, some fair questions to be raised. Is there going to be some outside help? I think we have seen the last of Cole Calhoun in a Rangers uniform. He ends the season with a 587 OPS and 12 home runs. I'm pretty sure seven or eight of those came in the month of May. So the rest have been really, really scattered. Um, I don't know if we're going to see Charlie Culberson next year, despite him being a great clubhouse guy and, you know, really bring up his numbers in the second half of the season. The first half was pretty darn abysmal and the Rangers had a lot of spots for good clubhouse guy, not great production, way too many for a team that wants to be competing for the playoffs. If they make that their goal next year, which I think it absolutely should be. I don't know if they're going to make it next year. They do have a long way to go. They probably need, I don't know, two or three starters, maybe one more bat, because at present, I mean, they've got Simeon, Seager, and Lowe. Those are your number one, two, three hitters, no doubt. If Adoles Garcia is your number four hitter, I think that's okay for now, but ideally, I mean, he's got an OPS in the 750, 756 on the year. I think he should probably be a number five hole hitter. Depends on the health of Mitch Garver and if Jonah Heim can be first half Jonah Heim all season long. Maybe that's your cleanup hitter, or maybe it's Josh Young. Maybe he takes a little bit of a step next year. He finishes the season with overall solid numbers, 26 games in the big leagues for him, five home runs, four doubles, an OPS of 654, which was just a little bit higher than what Ezekiel Duran did in his 58 games. Ezekiel Duran had a 643 OPS. Josh Smith showed some real promise. Again, the offensive numbers weren't quite there. The batting average was below 200. The on base just over 300, but he showed some competitive at bats, played defensively really well, stole bases, did things that provided a whole lot of value at the big league level, even if the rest of the numbers weren't quite where you wanted them. Got some really impressive numbers from Mark Mathias and ends the year with a 919 OPS with the Rangers in 24 games, five home runs as well for him. Uh, right alongside Josh Young. I think he's got a part to play on this team. Is he an everyday player? I don't know. I don't know if he's as good as these numbers indicate, but he's definitely got something there. He has been able to play left field and third base and first base, and I think he could play second base or maybe not shortstop in a pinch, but I think he's got a, a value on this team as a bench guy come in and absolutely mash off the bench. Could he provide more offensive value than Bubba Thompson? Eh, maybe. But Bubba's been a real revelation this year as well. He ends the year with 55 games and a 613 OPS, which is a little higher than I thought it would be. Uh, didn't struggle as much at the big league level as I thought. 
18 stolen bases to just three times caught stealing, and on base over 300 at 302. Again, better than I thought. So he's definitely going to be in competition for the roster next year. I'm pretty sure he's going to be on it. Is he going to be the everyday starter in left field? I don't think so. But I think he definitely made the Rangers open their eyes at what he could do this year. His speed is a legit weapon. He is legit top of the scale fast. He is able to play very well defensively in center field, left field, not as much right field. The arm isn't quite big enough for that, but they still played him out there quite a bit. Uh, ideally, he is left field or center field, probably left field, but you put it an outfield defense of Adolis in right, Leody in center, and Bubba in left. That is the best outfield defense in all of Major League Baseball. It is going to save you a whole lot of runs and provide a whole lot of value on the defensive side of the ball. But I'm going to have a lot more in the coming weeks of just analyzing players and their seasons. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to do a little bit of a playoff primer, which former Rangers are in the playoffs, what to root for, what I'm rooting for, what I think is going to happen, some predictions, whatever. But I just want to give an overall a lot of thank yous. This is my fourth season doing Locked on Rangers, uh, third without the great Morgan Price doing this thing solo for three years and it's been some not great baseball throughout the majority of it this is my 13th season obsessed with the Rangers I did watch before as a kid but you know 2010 is what really hooked me on baseball in general it's my ninth season writing or podcasting about baseball my seventh actually getting paid for it and uh it's it's what I decided to dedicate my life to and I'm still kind of amazed that I get to make a living watching and talking and speaking and writing things about baseball and knowing things about sports. I am still generally blown away by it. And I want to thank every single one of you who has listened to, whether you've listened to one episode or all 692 episodes at this point, uh, whether we are friends in real life or just some random stranger you found on the internet, or you're just looking for some, if you just stumbled in here randomly for this last episode, uh, welcome. Welcome do a podcast every day it's about the rangers if you like them stick around but i am genuinely very grateful for all of you who have stuck around even in the bad seasons and for those to join when the rangers actually figure out how to win again hopefully that's next year i'm hoping that uh this playoff drought can end sooner as opposed to later but i am blown away blown away by the fact that y'all listen to me all the time or at all really and I try not to take that for granted because it is a real honor to be able to do this. Um, thanks to Jeff, who is Jeff Carr, who is the czar of the Locked On MLB channel, to my fellow hosts around the network who are able to pick me up when things get tough. And for my friends and family, uh, mom and uh, old Maddie McCutcheon and my dad as well, who will listen as, as often as they do, honestly hearing my voice that much can get a little grating for someone who hears it in their earbuds and in their car and also in real life. So uh, I understand the need to occasionally take a little bit of a break. But thank you all so much for listening, getting me up to a thousand YouTube subscribers in a year, even in a year when the Rangers were not exactly good. It's been fun. Looking forward to the playoffs. Probably going to take some time. I, I, I'm probably not going to watch a whole lot of baseball this weekend, just kind of decompress and uh, get away from it for a little bit because it has been a long, hard season. But I am grateful for each and every single one of y'all who has listened. And uh, thank y'all so much. That's going to do it for this episode of Locked on Rangers and for this 2022 season. And until next time, don't forget to enjoy baseball. <laughs>